Good evening. My name is uh, Gina Francis Makwabi. Uh, I'll be chairing this session today. And uh, I'm the consultant physician nephrologist working in Tanzania with Africa Healthcare Network. Um, so I, I would like to welcome you all to today's uh, AHN fireside chat and today's series uh, number 59. Um, uh, our topic today is the potential role of telenephrology in Africa. And this is a very important topic, uh, especially in our environment in Africa, uh, where there are a lot of uh, issues uh, regarding uh, nephrology, issues of distance, issues, issues of uh, shortage of nephrologists. There are so many issues. So that makes uh, this topic very relevant in, in, in our area. So it's now a great honor to invite uh, our today's speaker, uh, who is Dr. Julius O'Kell. Uh, Dr. Julius O'Kell is a consultant physician and nephrologist at Aga Khan Hospital in Kisumu, Kenya, and uh, head of Department of Nephrology, Aga Khan Hospital, Kisumu, in Kenya. He's also an adjunct uh, lecturer at uh, Maseno University in Kisumu. Uh, Dr. Okero um, had, uh, did his uh, nephrology fellowship at the University of Alberta in Canada. So Dr. Okero, uh, you are welcome uh, and uh, we are excited and waiting to hear from you. Can you proceed please? Uh, thank you Dr. Gina for that kind introduction. Um, I'll just share my slides. Uh, just let me know whether they're, can you see the slides now? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, thank All you right. everyone yeah. right. for inviting me to give uh, this talk. It's been a uh, back and forth between me and Lloyd. I postponed a little bit, but thank you organizers for giving me the chance to give this talk, uh, which is the potential of telenephrology in enhancing CKD care in Africa. Um, I think this is, I agree with Dr. Gina, it's quite relevant in our setup where we are facing different challenges uh, with the nephrology care especially CKD care. So during the next um, 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 40 or so minutes, um, I'll go through this topic and the outline will be a look at some definitions and then look at the barriers of CKD care in Africa. Um, and then look at how telenephrology applications in CKD care and uh, renal pathology can be used to overcome some of the barriers uh, in care. So in terms of definition, uh, the I'm American tele Telemedicine Association defines- to interfere, Dr. Okero. Sorry, a minute. Um, is that better? Yes, yes, yes. All Thank right. You. Yeah. So I was just uh, going through some of the definitions. Um, as per American Telemedicine Association defines telemedicine, the use of medical information um, uh, exchanged um, uh, from one side to another electronically in terms of communication to improve patients' healthcare status or outcome. And uh, it's also variously defined as the delivery of healthcare and or information using electronic systems. Therefore, tele nephrology is, will be the application of this telemedicine in the care of uh, um, kidney patients or in the practice of nephrology, where you use uh, information uh, between uh, um, healthcare providers or healthcare systems in a view to communicate the health of our patients and therefore uh, improve their outcomes. And as we know, CKD burden in the in all worldwide is increasing. Uh, this figure is put between 10 to 16 percent worldwide, and of course, there's various uh, variations. Uh, but in this particular slide, I just wanted to highlight the burden that we see in terms of CKD in Africa, which has particularly a uh, big burden uh, because of unique challenges that we face in taking care of patients in Africa. And this particular study is published in CARE in 2008. Uh, they looked at population of CKD between 1990 and uh, 2016. Uh, but what I wanted to highlight was the burden of CKD in low and middle income countries, which was disproportionate to the areas. Actually, these low and middle income countries had a, a burden of up to 60% if you look at the age adjusted daily score. Uh, and this was thought to be due to the predominantly young age of the CKD patients we see. And of course, the rising uh, level of uh, diabetes mellitus, which is increasing the prevalence in this population. So although the prevalence of CKD may be similar or close to the rest of the, uh, the world in terms of uh, uh, CKD prevalence in Africa, we face a disproportionate burden of CKD because of the young population that we see, and of course there's increasing prevalence. 
So there's greater need to come up with innovative uh, methods to better care of these patients, reduce this burden of disease in our setup. And some of the barriers that actually we face when taking care of these patients, there are system and patient specific barriers. In terms of system barriers that we face, we know that uh, there's poor recognition of CKD. And this stems from the poor understanding of this condition by the primary care providers, uh, partly because of the training level that they receive, but also lack of the continuous medical uh, education that they receive once they graduate. Um, also, this leads to the late referrals that we see as nephrologists where patients are referred late, leading to a bigger pr a percentage of them uh, starting dialysis as an emergency, which you know portends poor, poor outcomes. Also, these patients, a bigger percentage of them of course start dialysis or care uh, without a fistula, which also has attendant uh, adverse outcomes. And of course, we know there is suboptimal distribution of nephrologists in most African countries, but also most African countries actually lack nephrologists. So there's lack of expertise in terms of taking care of these patients. In terms of patient barriers, we have limited literacy across Africa, leading to poor seeking, uh, health seeking behaviors, patient presenting late, and also some cultural practices. Um, across Africa, remote areas, patients still use herbal medications, which not only worsen uh, their uh, CKD or pre, uh, pre, uh, cause AKR, but also delay their presentation in hospitals. Uh, the low socioeconomic uh, status across Africa also impacts on patients' health seeking behavior and their ability to access care. And this contributes to uh, late presentation and also poor outcome. And we know that most of the CKD patients are also frail. M most of these are diabetic, maybe post stroke, and also are weak. And uh, the ability to actually move across uh, um, this, uh, these regions to seek health care. Most of nephrologists we know live in urban areas, away from rural areas make it a challenge for these patients to move across. And most of them actually don't make it to, to seek appropriate care. And of course, geographical distance from where these patients stay to where they are supposed to seek healthcare in a tertiary institution where the nephrologist is actually far off, and this impedes the care of these particular patients. So looking at these barriers, then it's important for us to innovate, innovate ways of trying to overcome these barriers to improve the care of our patients. Some of them, of course, will require heavy investment like the training of nephrologists take longer, but we should seek other ways, for example, of trying to overcome these barriers to improve the care of our patients. And this is just uh, um, emphasizing the issue about remote location of patients and the Im impact they have on survival. In this study by Thomas Sonital, looking at US patients, and they're looking at the distance of dialysis patients, how far they live from a dialysis center, uh, dialysis center in terms of impact in their, uh, on, on outcome. And actually, they found that the patient who lived farthest from the closest hemodialysis center, uh, for example, 4,100 miles away, had an increased rate of uh, increased mortality of up to 21% compared to patients who lived closer to dialysis unit. So the further away you live from, my, from your healthcare provider, the worse of your outcome because of the barrier of the distance. So we should actually come up with ways to try to overcome this to improve the care of our patient. This is just an um, illustration of how badly we are faring in terms of Expertise in Africa, this study was done by Bello et al, um, looking at the global distribution of nephrologists, and you can see in this heat map that developing countries um, in, uh, in green up there, North America, Europe, and some countries in South America, having more than 15, per, uh, 15 nephrologists per million population. But look at the, the red in Africa here, showing us most African countries, especially sub-Saharan Africa, having less than five nephrologist per million population. That's a very small number. Giving this nephrologist, uh, I mean, it's really difficult to cover the whole population with this number of nephrologists. And actually some of the countries with the least number of nephrologists per million population are found in Sub-Saharan Africa. You look at Malawi, Mozambique, Ethiopia, and Uganda in this slide, maybe uh, since that time, the number have increased. By that time, they had less than 0.01 nephrolog uh, nephrologists per million population. That's a very small number indeed that we can't pretend, pretend to that uh, would actually be able to cover uh, the whole of the CKD population in those countries. So what's the opportunity that we have? The opportunity we have is uh, overall Africa has over the last few years, a high, high mobile phone penetration. And this is actually growing. If you look at this publication, looking at the penetration of mobile phones in Africa between uh, 2015 and projection is that by 2025, almost half of Africa will have some mobile phone tele, uh, telephony. Up to 52% of the African population will have mobile phone penetration. 
And they're doing fairly well in terms of, if you look at the adult population owning a mobile phone in Africa, some countries are doing, as well as the Western population, look at this study looking at South Africa, 89% uh, of that population had mobile phones compared to 89% in, uh, in America. And Kenya, Ghana, 82% of the population at least owning a mobile phone. Uh, Uganda is not badly off, 65%, as well as 73%. And we know that with this mobile telephony, there's also increased um, uh, connectivity with the internet. So this looks like a great equalizer. If you have a great penetration of internet with mobile phones, we could leverage on this to roll out uh, telenephrology to try overcome some of the barriers that you looked at in previous slides and improve the care of our patients. So if you look at telenephrology um, in, in, in the spectrum uh, of telenephrology and areas that you can actually apply it, you can actually apply it across the spectrum of care in CKD and even other aspects of uh, renal care. Uh, we can look at it in pre-dialysis care, uh, CKD clinic follow-ups. It's also been applied in, in terms of working up patients, uh, pre-transplant workup of patients and assessing patients in the wait list. Home dialysis, uh, practical application as well, of nephrology, as well as having, a, for example, a campus with satellite uh, uh, centers of nephrology and doing follow-up on that. Telenephrology is also quite big in terms of renal education, not only in terms of CME, like what you're doing now, CMEs in nephrology, they're also good in, in, in terms of educating patients and their caregivers as well. And renal pathology, a big area in Africa, where you have a lot of deficiency in Africa, there's a lot of application of telenephrology uh, across the world. Of course, global health platforms with advocacy, uh, which of course affects the uh, delivery of uh, renal services, also we can apply telenephrology. So look at some of these areas uh, individually briefly. Uh, in this study that I actually participated in, some of the, the improves improved access, especially in geographically remote areas where patients have trouble to access nephrologists. In found that if well applied, the clinic attendance by this uh, uh, by this improves. Um, and also saves a lot of time in terms of patients not having to travel long distances. Also, the shortage of nephrologists, as you have seen, some countries having less than 0 0.1 uh, per million uh, population of nephrologists. We can't pretend that these nephrologists can cover the whole, not having to travel from their center to go to other centers to take care of patients, but can take care of patients in his setup and can have leverage to reach to even to uh, uh, many other patients. Patient monitoring. Um, is improved. Uh, many setups, they've actually looked at how to use nephrology in monitoring CKD patients, monitoring the blood pressure, for example, monitoring patients with nephrotic syndrome where they monitor the proteinuria by a uh, dipstick remotely. And this actually enhances patient outcomes because the review is actually enhanced in this review. And most of this nephrology may be a bit higher but as the utilization of telephrology uh, spreads over time, the cost is reduced directly in terms of review of patients, individual in terms of unit cost, but also indirect cost where you save time for these patients having to, saving them time to do other things that can be economically viable, but also saving times of, uh, saving the time when nephrologists be able to ascend, attend to other patients as well. And also in many studies that have been done, they found that uh, many patients report that this, uh, these systems are efficient and there's a great patient satisfaction in uh, this uh, service when it's uh, well rolled out and uh, uptaken by the patients. And in this particular study, we looked at various ways in which telenephrology can be applied. And this can be broadly cl uh, classified in synchronous domains and asynchronous domains. In synchronized domain, we have this uh, real life, like what you're doing now, interactive uh, video conferencing, for example. This is real-time video, and this can be used in uh, communicating between patient and provider can be used for say, uh, consulting, for example, in the clinics, teaching across like what you're doing, or CMEs, discussing treatment with patients. Um, and usually you can have a group, group clinic sessions to improve compliance of patients, um, and also have other uh, expert, ex experts in, uh, in, in nephrology care, nurses, uh, nutritionists, social care workers, joining the nephrologists uh, during these cares and enhancing uh, what uh, takes place in these particular clinics. They can also be used, of course, in training nephrologists and also training nurses and other healthcare providers in low-income countries to enhance overall care of CKD patients and, of course, promoting 
CKD management as well. The advantages of this is because, because it's real-time, questions can be asked and, of course, uh, answered during, uh, during these sessions and clarifications can be sought. The problems, of course, you need good internet connections and the initial setup may require um, uh, investments in TV monitors, good internet connection cable, which may be prohibitive in some setup, but overall, once it's set up, uh, continued um, uh, use, uh, the cost per patient actually comes down. And of course, uh, although it can be used for teaching and empowerment of uh, healthcare providers in uh, remote areas, hand-on demonstration like kidney biopsy, microscopy of urine may not be possible and patient may, may have to uh, travel to a campus to be able to get some of these hands-on skills. And of course, mobile telephony also quite versatile. You can use telephone, you can use send, uh, sending of images uh, in terms of reviewing patients. This can be used in patient referrals, a consultation between a nephrologist and uh, other healthcare providers can be done before they transfer patients to the clinic. They can be given instru instructions in initial management of patients, stabilization of patients, and also um, doing initial workup before patients come and therefore reducing on time. Also, because it's real time, the advantage is that, uh, is that uh, questions can be asked and clarification sought. Uh, but long distance calls and setup of calls may actually be a bit expensive in such, uh, some setup being a disadvantage. Asynchronous domains or um, uh, not real time, uh, you can look at store and forward um, um, media where you can use emails, transmitting laboratory data or images to expert. This has been used a lot in telenephrology where uh, images may be prepared by uh, uh, after preparation of light microscopy and this is prepared and sent to a consultant for example abroad they look at them and send their um, uh, their report over time maybe a day or two um, and this uh, of course enables transfer of uh, large data um, and enables consultation but because it's actually uh, required phone and m health can also be a synchronous way where patients can actually healthcare provided or a health issue may use text messages for screening or prevention programs, reminders to attend clinic in patients and also promote, uh, promoting various aspects of CKD care. And the advantage of course is cutting down costs and no need for patients to travel uh, to come for in, in hospital uh, reviews. Self-monitoring is another way, uh, it's another uh, uh, method that's coming up quite a bit. Uh, this involves placement of a sensor, for example, in the body. And these are monitored remotely in a center and uh, intervention can be applied immediately or patients can be, can be asked to come in center for modifications of either prescription or procedures to be done. Um, usually uh, quite a, um, helpful, for example, in monitoring blood pressures and other health parameters, blood sugars. And when you apply it, for example, in uh, peritoneal dialysis uh, 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 monitoring, uh, the management may be altered without patients having to transfer by automatically altering the machine, providing the peritoneal dialysis. Um, of course, this is uh, good because the monitoring is uh, better and this may ultimately lead to great, uh, better patient outcomes. Uh, the disadvantage sometimes is false alarm with these sensors in the body, making patients uncomfortable. And this need always to wear a device which may make some patients uncomfortable. Um, this is just a brief uh, look at how CKD clinics are set up and also uh, post-transplant clinics. Usually in the video conference, you can have a multidisciplinary uh, team seeing this particular patient or a single sp uh, specialist seeing this particular patient. And there are two models. One model may actually review the patients at home where there's a connection between the, the, the hospital or the center offering care and the patient at home. And uh, this review of patient um, data after they do a lab in the nearest center that transmits this lab to the hospital and uh, review is done. But the most common and the most effective in terms of review is a multidisciplinary. Mm -hmm. So I, I was just saying that uh, the most um, uh, eff efficacious and the most uh, uh, method, uh, the method has been found to be better in terms of reviewing this patient CKD or post-transplant clinic is a multidisciplinary uh, team review where patients um, usually go to a setup which is uh, well um, set up for, for, for video conferencing and reviewing patients. These centers are manned by, for example, a nurse near where the patient stays. So the patients for that session review actually come and are triaged in that particular center. Blood pressures are taken, vital signs are taken, and then sent to the campus where the multidisciplinary team are. 
they review these patients. A discussion is actually held remotely, and the patients actually fully reviewed after review, of course, of the patient's labs and also um, images that may have been done prior. The nurse coordinator in that particular center, which usually is close to the patient, transmits these images before. It's actually been found to be better than reviewing patients, um, for example, a single specialist reviewing patients uh, at home um, without, for example, vital signs having been taken prior and also not having reviewed labs and other uh, vitals before the review is done. Remote monitoring, we've mentioned that as well, and also mobile text can be applied in various ways to promote clinic attendance, to promote medication adherence, and also to promote patient communication to providers with which enhance patient reviews and care and ultimately outcomes of patients. So do these systems work? Actually they do. Um, there are not a lot of publications in Africa, but I got this one which will publish in the KI. This is actually, unfortunately a single center in Australia that was a two year prospective cost control study. And they're actually looking at the care of uh, CKD patients and transplant patients in the outpatient setup. In this particular review, they looked at the, within the first year, the primary outcome was the feasibility of teleconference in running the clinics. And it was actually found to be feasible in both the first and the second year. And uh, the secondary outcome, which was looking at the differences in terms of uh, the surrogate markers, the blood pressure, the renal function and obstruction, there was actually no difference between patients that were reviewed via teleconferencing, that is remotely by video conferencing and patients who came uh, to have a face-to-face -face, uh, review. So in conclusion, they actually concluded that uh, telehealth video conferencing in terms of CKD review and transplant patient review was feasible and sustainable and was comparable to standard of care in this particular study. And I think other places which have actually offered this, um, uh, various publications actually return the same uh, uh, verdict that it's actually feasible, sustainable, uh, usually very high um, patient uh, satisfaction survey and ultimately low cost of care. In terms of education, uh, we know uh, telenephrology has been applied in a great extent in terms of enhancing education. Um, I mean, a practical example is what you're doing now. Um, and we know that this can be applied in terms of video conferencing to enhance the capacity of the primary care providers what you've learned in nephrology is that the nephrologist uh, who sits in the clinic probably sees the end of the chain. We see the patients after having passed through a lot of healthcare providers and this need to educate the primary healthcare providers, not only to recognize the, the, uh, the CKD, start initial management, but also refer appropriately. So there's a lot of application of e-consulting, video conferencing, trying to, to enhance uh, primary, care, uh, primary care provider education. Um, there's also informational websites, um, mobile applications, interactive video response, virtual clinics, I mean, virtual support groups in terms of enhancing um, education among various um, uh, groups of healthcare professionals. We know various professionals now, uh, nephrologists, primary healthcare providers may be in a group. And the typical thing that you're seeing now, it was subgroups that are quite educational actually in many instances where publications are sought, consultations are made, um, and even support in terms of uh, patient care is actually done. And there's also multi, multi modular programs where you can have video conferencing combined with uh, social media uh, and other web based uh, uh, information websites to promote education of, 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 of either uh, healthcare providers or, um, uh, or patients as well. And in the same vein of education, uh, the, the advent of social media has been really explosive in terms of just uh, revolution, uh, revolutionizing the, the, the education, not only in the for educate education, but also patient education. By the, for, the, the social media, we can do a lot of research actually taking place and a lot of education, medical education in, in uh, the social media is actually quite, quite big. The social not only networking that takes place, advocacy, not only for patients to uh, get better care, but also advocacy for more Financing, for example, of um, nephrology and other um, aspects of uh, clinical care of nephrology, patient, educa uh, patient education also, a lot of it taking place in, uh, in social media. And you can see that um, worldwide, 4.4 billion out of almost about the seven, pe uh, 7 billion people worldwide are in social media. So across Twitter, Telegram, Facebook, TikTok, and uh, WhatsApp, their discussions are taking place uh, between healthcare providers, uh, case-based learning are taking place within this social media platform. 
surgical videos, WhatsApp um, sharing, Twitter sharing, visual based uh, learning as well taking place, educational groups, um, then tutorials as well taking place. Tutorials basically a set of Twitter uh, messages sent on a given topic in Twitter that is used to elucidate on a topic, for example, a given ephology topic. And also journal clubs taking place within a, uh, within a, a social media. We know NEFJC is one of that um, um, journal club that takes place every two weeks, but based in social media. So social media is really big in terms of revolutionizing education. And this has really enhanced not only education overall, but medical education, nephrology, and also patient education, and also um, advocacy and research as well. Uh, these are podcast postcards um, are run by various um, uh, websites and also journals. I just put a, a, a given number of uh, uh, podcasts that uh, those of us who are interested can actually enlist and listen to. Most of them are run by uh, prominent, uh, sorry, most of them are run by prominent uh, uh, journals like ASN Boss, uh, podcast, usually um, um, uh, before publication of articles, for example, uh, an expert may come on and elucidate or explain more on a given uh, publish, uh, published uh, article, uh, which gives a very great insight, usually 15 to 20 minutes. And actually, I went to listen to this uh, po podcast, usually giving very key messages. You actually don't even need to read some of the, um, the articles. And they're actually quite quick for busy nephrologists, busy healthcare providers, you can listen to it um, while driving to work or in between patient or doing something else. And they're great um, source of uh, good medical education for nephrologists. Uh, most of these are run by uh, different journals. This one is run by the ISN, uh, quite uh, topical as well in terms of um, 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 uh, putting out um, um, expert reviews of publications in the care journals, which are usually run by the uh, ISN. Interestingly, I have to put this one up, the NFJC, um, uh, Journal clubs have joined some of them, usually running every two weeks. And they discuss very pertinent journals uh, on Twitter, um, usually nephrology fellows, uh, expert nephrologists in various fields of the publicized um, uh, or the article being discussed is invited. And they are a great source of information. And those of us who can actually join them, they're quite great. And uh, in this particular review articles uh, uh, in KI, I uh, look at the social media revolution in nephrology. The author actually in conclusion said that uh, Nephrologist may actually leave uh, his social media across from morning listening to podcasts as he drives to work. At work, may for example, send a Twitter if you have a difficult case. Ask Reno is a very good Twitter handle where most Nephrologists will answer you if you have a difficult Nephrology case. And it's actually a good media to share and discuss difficult cases. And also there are blogs that run um, on web, on, on, on the internet, where people discuss um, a given uh, Nephrology topic. NEF Fellow Network is a, is a blog run by fellows actually, supported by the attendings and usually have very great blogs on particular difficult, for example, acid-based balances uh, and electrolyte, the imbalance uh, that they discussed that are pro uh, offer great insight of those who can actually go through them at their free time. And also, of course, you can participate in general clubs at the, at the end of the day. So social media has actually revolutionized really education in. Uh, in, in, in nephrology and a great source of support in terms of education. And really, if you have a connection to the internet, there's no reason you should not get most of the information you want and the support that you want in terms of taking care of your patient. There's a great uh, uh, source of support out there that you can actually tap into. What about pathology and renal pathology in terms of telenephrology? Um, usually the, there's electronic transmission of digital images of pathology for education, research, diagnosis, and consultation. And it has emerged as a very good innovative way of supporting diagnosis of renal disease and enhancing the capacity to diagnose renal diseases in developing countries. We know that there's a, a problem really in renal pathology, especially where we practice. Like where I practice, a lot of my kidney biopsies that I do actually sent outside um, to South Africa. Some of them are sent to India. Um, and this telenephrology, if well set up, would be a great source of support for the general nephrologists in terms of supporting them to diagnose um, various kidney diseases and ultimately leading to improvement in our patient care. There are very innovative ways uh, online that have been, uh, that have come up to support telenephrology. Um, and uh, there are various uh, ways of which this can be done again by live conferencing as well, if there's a good connection 
where a general pathologist may prepare a light microscope or stain the various uh, IF media um, and then share it with an expert across live and then discuss the case. There are a lot of online uh, courses and talks on pathology as well. Uh, journal clubs, online consults are there as well as stored and sent images across that may support our nephrologists in Africa, um, our pathologists in Africa to, to be better diagnose uh, kidney diseases and support us in managing our patients after kidney biopsy. Um, I, I decided to share some of the websites that have a great source of support in uh, telenephrology um, uh, consoles. And one of them is um, uh, glomcon.org. Uh, this is a great, great website with a lot of support in terms of uh, the live conferencing in uh, reviewing various diseases in, uh, in, in nephrology, looking at various slides, and also there's a visual uh, fellowship programs where general nephrologists actually enroll and they actually taught over six weeks, eight weeks, and at the end of which they are actually enhance their skills to be able to support um, uh, uh, tele-nephrology in their centers actually. So this is a very good support online that um, has been found to be quite good and actually uh, and one of those ASN awards in terms of innovation in supporting kidney care uh, in resource uh, limited setups. What about the appliance, uh, the applying, applying telenephrology in dialysis support and monitoring? Uh, this can be done in various ways. Um, in modalities um, in which I've participated, you can have the a main campus, uh, which usually is a teaching hospital. And this campus is connected to remote satellite units of dialysis. So these satellite units of dialysis usually have patients getting reviewed from the main campus. Ward rounds are done usually uh, weekly or bi-weekly the multidisciplinary team would come uh, into the teledialysis tele room and the patients are reviewed remotely with a nurse taking care uh, of the patient, taking the vital signs, um, um, sending the patient vitals, sending the patient labs and the discussion is actually held. This has also been applied in home hemodialysis program. Home hemodialysis is really big. North America is really catching up where patients actually dialyze in their homes with support and they actually remotely monitored and supported from a campus or a remote setup. Um, um, also in New Zealand, this is actually quite big. And also uh, home peritoneal dialysis, which not only can you monitor the patients, but also a change of prescription may actually be done uh, remotely in this particular area. Um, a situation I think that may actually quite apply is my country, Kenya. Um, I mean, we've had an explosion of uh, uh, dialysis in our country. Prior to the year, I think 2013, there were hardly about um, um, maybe 15, 30 uh, hemodialysis center in the whole of the country. But now we have 151 and counting of uh, hemodialysis centers. This has spread across all the counties, there are about 47. Each of these counties has at least one nephrology, uh, one hemodialysis center and Nairobi, which is the capital, has uh, more, maybe 20 or 30 dialysis centers. We have currently about 14 nephrologists in the country. Unfortunately, about majority of us live in Nairobi. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll probably estimate about 90%. Um, and the patient on hemodialysis also have really increased uh, from about 600 prior to public funding of dialysis to about 5,500. Unfortunately, with this expansion, there's not been uh, a, a good uh, program in which this, this center is actually supported in terms of expertise. Uh, and also uh, supervision. Most of these uh, um, counties have hemodialysis centers run by nurses without any nephrology. Telenephrology will be quite applicable where these centers may be linked to a campus, for example. Nairobi uh, uh, having a number of nephrologists may take care of the surrounding hemodialysis unit, which are remotely connected to a teledialysis center where patients are reviewed um, and actually uh, they're managed and their prescription altered appropriately depending on the outcome. And also various towns, for example, Mombasa may have a telecampus or where patients actually, uh, where nephrologists there will review patients surrounding uh, Mombasa like Tana River, uh, Taita Taveta, Kilifi, and Kisumu will do the, pay, uh, the same for Western and would have a campus, for example, in Northeastern. That actually would work quite well. In many countries like uh, Canada, for example, which is a huge country, this is actually quite prominent in terms of teledialysis. Most um, uh, teaching uh, hospitals have remote hemodialysis center in which actually they run remotely and nephrologists travel uh, to see the remote centers maybe once, three months 
every three months or six months just to see what's going on there. But management is actually done remotely. And in terms of publication, do patients reviewed remotely on hemodialysis fare any worse off compared to patients who dialyze in center? And the answer is probably no. In this publication, uh, in uh, J uh, in uh, C. Jason, um, in uh, 2010, uh, this was American uh, uh, publication. They looked at 2,663 patients between 1990 and 2005. And they looked at these patients, uh, those who dialyze in center compared to those who dialyze remotely and were, were, were taken care of remotely. And in terms of one year and five year survival, there was actually no difference. Okay. Uh, so this is actually a Canadian uh, model. There was really no difference. So in terms of chronic hemodialysis, patients receiving remotely delivered specialized care, that's hemodialysis, initially actually fared better compared to patients who were dialyzing in center. Um, and this actually is a model that can be applicable to other centers or other areas that have uh, challenges, like in our case with nephrologists who may not be uh, available in all the centers that have hemodialysis. Uh, although in this discussion, actually in this particular paper, when uh, we discussed actually in one of the general clubs, uh, it was a, a, a good paper, but uh, some of the, the weaknesses we actually found is that uh, in most of the, the, the centers, the, the teaching centers in uh, Canada, Patients who actually transfer to remote hemodialysis usually are stable patients. Patients have to stabilize initially before they're transferred. So maybe uh, uh, indication bias uh, may, may have contributed to the initial better survival uh, that they saw in at one year of patients dialyzing in remote centers because by indication, these patients were to be stabilized first in the teaching a hospital before they transferred. Having said that, there was no, uh, the patient dialyzing remotely had no, um, did not pay, uh, fare worse off compared to patients who are dialyzing in center. So this is a model that can be applied, I think, in our setup and can probably get good results if well planned and rolled out. And getting, of course, uh, the buy-in from the many stakeholders that should be involved in this process. And uh, this is um, a model applying a remote mon uh, monitoring for uh, peritoneal dialysis, uh, a, a publication from Colombia. So this uh, publication was for patients receiving automated peritoneal dialysis, the cycler at home. And these patients uh, were being monitored from a remote center and their prescription will actually change depending on how they were doing. And the study looked at a two month without uh, remote monitoring, uh, one month transition, and then two months with remote monitoring. And what was found actually that uh, with remote monitoring, there was more prescription adjustments, meaning more interventions were taking place there were more preemptive consultations. So they would pick up problems and actually tackle them before problem uh, before a uh, patient would have adverse outcomes. And the blood pressure was actually better controlled with remote monitoring and correction of the peritoneal dialysis, meaning they were getting better dialysis and better ultrafiltration. So remote patient monitoring, especially when applied to automated peritoneal dialysis, may be a good uh, method to optimize patient and improve their dialysis remotely without having them traveling to a center uh, for review. Is telenephrology uh, cost-effective? Probably yes. Uh, we don't have studies in Africa, but in cases in uh, other places where it has been applied in, uh, uh, in wide scale, it's actually been found to be cost-effective. In this cost-effective model in Australia, uh, looking at patients uh, prior to transplant and their workup, uh, in this particular study, uh, uh, 143 patients uh, were reviewed via teleconferencing um, versus face-to-face -face patients who are 159. And those who actually listed for transplant were 50 in the video conferencing arm versus one or two in the first face arm. And if you look at the cost, the cost was actually almost half in the uh, telenephrology arm, that's video conferencing versus face-to-face uh, -face reviews. And the times taken to listing, meaning completion of reviews, was also almost half in the video conferencing versus the face-to-face -face review. And also time to the initial review, meaning time that you spend preparing the patient referral was actually much less uh, in the teleconferencing arm versus face-to-face -face arm. So it seems that this is a cost-effective uh, method proven in other setup. And of course, there are other indirect costs that may not have been uh, pointed out in this particular paper of patients being more productive and uh, getting engaged in economically viable enterprises and overall boosting the economy. Of course, in those countries which are quite conscious of climate change, they actually wrote that 51 tons of carbon emission actually reduced because of reduction of travel on the road.
Telenephrology during COVID-19 epidemic, I mean, COVID epidemic has forced us to adopt um, various methods of not only communicating, but also doing things. Um, I mean, this started before COVID-19, but a lot of um, uh, CMEs and meetings are now, are now run remotely because of COVID-19. But I just put up this to show that it's possible to actually do telenephrology during COVID-19. This is a hospital in the US that um, sent out surveys to try to uh, find out the perspective of patients and doctors uh, during the rollout of emergency uh, telenephrology during COVID-19. And what came out after 400 patients and 193 pediatric nephrology patients were, were actually surveyed. And this review is actually done on Zoom and other teleconferencing uh, models as shown there. Patients actually quite liked it, that it was logistically easier and uh, quite equivalent compared to in-person reviews. Uh, although when it was done, like it was done in, a, in terms of emergency, there were concerns with the technological aspects uh, because it was not well planned and also lack of physical exam and review of results. Uh, if not well planned, but if well rolled out, this is a great tool to use during this time uh, of COVID-19. Uh, COVID of course, there's a concern with uh, going full telenephrology in some of our practices because most of the uh, jurisdiction, there's no, there's no well uh, discussed or well laid out remuneration or compensation platform if you do review a patient uh, remotely versus a patient travels to the clinic. And also, uh, there should be a, 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 a hospital in terms of ratio before of all the culture. So what seems to have um, devices for hemodialysis you could work are feel free and a nephrologist or a clinical care provider will actually remotely um, review these patients and alter the, the hemodialysis as they go about their work. Of course, that's a dream. And uh, of course, the initial cost may be expensive, but that's probably where telenephrology hopefully should take us to. Um, as I wrap up, uh, just look at what are the take home messages. Uh, really, telenephrology has a great potential in overcoming challenges in offering kidney care, uh, especially in Africa where you have a lot of problems. It is a potential to overcome a geographical barriers cost-effectively and in a timely uh, manner. The, we also stand to maximally utilize the few experts that you have in the field of nephrology. And also with, uh, we, we stand to enhance collaboration with other experts, not only in education, but also in research worldwide if you adopt it. Uh, there's also improvement in continuous medical education, not only in among the nephrologists, but also in the primary care providers who are really the patients, uh, the, the people come with uh, across the patients first and determine when the patients come to us and the initial workup. There's also the potential to enhance consultations between us as uh, nephrologists and primary healthcare providers, collaborations between different healthcare providers within country, uh, in the internet and also worldwide. Patient education, empowerment, advocacy can really be enhanced uh, in terms of telenephrology and social media has actually shown us this. Um, uh, really revolutionizes how we communicate with our patients and how patients get information in the internet. And also it has a, a great way of enhancing patient satisfaction and, um, um, and, and feedback um, when, when well planned and rolled out. Also in the advent of COVID-19, it's almost becoming a necessity. And hopefully even after COVID-19, we would probably run our clinics um, both at a hybrid system, both at the traditional way and also giving our patients who come from far off, not near where we practice, a choice of choosing where they want to be reviewed by a telenephrology so that we take care of them uh, cost effectively without having, to, uh, without having them travel all the way to see, to, uh, see us in our clinics. Thank you so much. I'll invite questions uh, from the audience if there are any and reactions. All right. Um, thank you, Julius. That was excellent presentation. And um, maybe before we proceed, uh, I just wanted to comment. Uh, Telenephrology in Africa, uh, and I'll talk specifically in Tanzania, it, it seems we are practicing telenephrology, but not in a formal way. And um, in terms that, you know, meaning that, you know, when it is very well um, practiced, then it is going to be, you know, to, to bring a lot of changes uh, in the way we practice nephrology. Uh, in, in Tanzania and in Africa, because it's surprisingly surprising that there is only f five, by average is five nephrologists per million population uh, in sub-Saharan Africa countries, almost all of them. 
So yeah. I think that would be the, the way to go uh, because it will take time you know, and years to train nephrologists enough to be compatible with the uh, population we have in this country, I mean, in Sub-Saharan Africa. So I would say this is the way to go. And I think uh, those who are old school nephrologists who, want, who do, doesn't want technology, I think we have to change and you know, go to this kind of technology to, for, for, for us to access more people and more patients in our areas. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, Dr. Dr. It was such an informative talk and um, the, I'm glad to have listened to it. I uh, learned much more than what I expected, having restricted mental nephrology to, to patient consultation only. I shall also want to thank, uh, thank AHN for leading the way in mental nephrology and that this series that you have been having, this is the 59th one, is a good example of uh, the application of mental nephrology. Um, just a um, comment about Dr. Kell's talk. Um, 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 I think we can divide the nephrology um, basically into uh, what the physician is gaining. That means uh, education mainly, uh, consultations, collaborations, etc. And what the patient is going to gain. And um, uh, my question is, um, I didn't get that part about reimbursement very nicely. What models do you think you can put for effective reimbursement of, uh, of doctors and nurses involved in nephrology, or even hospitals that want to be interested in knowing how the reimbursement is going to occur? Insurance companies, how they can be brought on board about the reimbursement for nephrology, knowing that it's quite cost effective and actually can save on expenses. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you. Um, I, I did put food, food most of the cost of public, public funded healthcare system, like in Canada, for example. So what would happen there was the reimbursement for nephrology was equivalent. It was equivalent to the reimbursement you'd get in face-to-face -face consultation. And even the time spent, because it was so well organized, uh, the time spent when you're doing telenephrology reviews, for example, in my CKD clinic, was almost equivalent to the time spent uh, by face-to-face -face consultation. Um, and we, we basically ran a hybrid system where, for example, I booked 10 patients in my clinic and four, five would opt to do telenephrology. So the first two, face-to-face, -face, the next one I'm told, next telenephrology, I switch to the camera. They, they bring on the patient, the nurse is across the, the center where the patient is, briefs me on the vital signs, the, 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 the lab of the patient and the imaging was already transmitted to the computer. So it was so seamless, you'd, you'd switch from one, one mode to the other, depending on the patient preference. And the remuneration is, is basically the same across. And the hospital that would opt to adopt nephrology was supported initially with the initial cost for, for, for setting up uh, nephrology. Um, that may be a bit different here now because you actually have to really discuss this. Uh, in Africa, for example, I think it will take a slightly more to set up a telenephrology consult. So the time spent may be slightly longer. So maybe the reimbursement may go slightly higher. I mean, that's a debate. Um, and, and also you may need to get more buy-in uh, from uh, patients, uh, from uh, hospitals, and also from insurance companies. But really from the point of insurance companies, if, if the cost overall actually goes down and uh, you prevent patients hospitalization, you pre pre prevent patients adverse outcomes, the long-term savings should actually incentivize them to buy into the, some of these uh, models. All right, um, can we get more comments? Can you read the chat, uh, Dr. Robert? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Mapave? Yes, please, Dr. Tarindo. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Wara asked a question and uh, uh, he, he reminded me a question I was asked here when I was about to answer it, uh, I, I think it was uh, you know, two weeks ago. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 I went off the line. Now, basically I was asking, you know, um, I mean, uh, I was explaining also the kind of telephone you are doing. It seems Africa Health Care Network is actually, uh, you know, uh, the, I mean, the way we are working actually, you know, it indicates that nephrology is actually possible and it, it probably it can uh, help actually spread the, the, the renal services, uh, at least in Africa. Now, 
Uh, I, I, but uh, yeah, okay. I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not addressing uh, Dr. Makwabe this time. I'm, I'm, I'm addressing the whole audience. I'm uh, Dr. Joseph Nairunga. I'm from, uh, I'm from Rwanda. Uh, I'm a certified nephrologist uh, from South Africa. I'm a College of Physician of South Africa, and uh, I work with Africa Healthcare Network. I now uh, I, I, we we have um, three dialysis units. One in Kigali, the other one, two, uh, like one is 150 kilometers from Kigali, the other one is about 300 kilometers from Kigali. Um, and uh, now we we have we are only two certified nephrologists in the country. One is a pediatric nephrologist, the other one is an adult nephrologist. Um, but uh, now, particularly for for those cases with acute kidney injury. Uh, far away from Kigali, that is near the Congolese border, that is in Gisenyi, near, near DRC, with Goma, and uh, the other one is in, in, in the south. Now, we, in that particular case, at, at least the telenephrology that we practiced is, um, of course, we, we don't deal with cases of CKD, but we have put together some data, which actually I presented at the World Congress of Nephrology. Um, um, and, and I think the results were, were, were amazing. Now, we, 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 ha, we have we started this one, uh, this process, uh, I think in 20, I think it was 2019. Now, but what happened is that we, a particular case is for acute kidney injury, acute kidney injury. Um, uh, you know, these patients who are, they are admitted, you know, from different district hospitals, but to, to those places that are near, that is near Jisenyi and, uh, and, and Juhunwe. These are the centers where we've got kidney, kidney services. So the doctor there, uh, well, he calls me and we discuss. Uh, you know, we, we discuss case, is there a need for dialysis? And you know, how is there any, uh, if there's no need for dialysis, what can we do in the meantime? Why, you know? Then you agree on, the, on, on, on how you can manage this patient. You know, you talk about particular case for acute kidney injury. Um, now, this data, when we put it together, we realized that we, I think we had quite a number, I mean, over 150 patients that we had seen over that time. We, we are still putting this data together. Probably we, we shall put it together then and, 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 and publish bigger data. So that we, we realized that 50% um, of these patients are managed, uh, are managed um, we, by conservative only. The other 50 percent, there are those who require acute kidney injury, and quite a significant, uh, you know, proportion actually do recover. We've had, of course, unfortunately, uh, s s some death, but this is a situation where probably we would have had maybe of all those patients that we put together, maybe more, more than 100 of them would have died. Um, so that's how, that, that's for acute kidney injury. Now, what uh, I've told you, we discussed with doctors on the telephone. Uh, then they actually, you know, there's a weekly report they give us, we, they send us, you know, reports on acute kidney injury. And then uh, every two weeks they give us, on, you know, with the CKD, which, which we're also following. And uh, probably I must say these patients that we are managing like this, I think they are better managed because they are managed by nephrology, they are better managed than those, those that are managed in the in, in referral hospitals. So I think... Uh, Telenephrology is actually making a big difference in Rwanda. Thank you. Thank you. That's good to know. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Joseph Ntalindwa. Uh, Alejandra, Bima, Bima, I've seen your hand. Thank you. Yeah, uh, let me just lower it. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Liz, for that wonderful uh, talk. You see, the thing about this telemedicine is, of course, you've got to have buy-in from government, okay? And... For instance, if you go to a place like Shanghai, I mean, they got a hotspot every 500 meters. So you are constantly on the internet, you are constantly in connection. The problem we have here back in South Africa is in the rural areas, etc. You know, although government is trying very hard to provide internet connections, etc., it's okay. still, the rollout is very slow. And hey. so we still struggle with having good internet connections and having good telemedicine yeah, microphone, microphone. consults. See, and I'm sure it's, it's the same in some oh. other parts of Africa. So, you know, if you look at uh, data charges, et cetera, you know, government has to do something to bring that down 
to a level that even you know every person who's earning a basic income can be able to afford so it's a wonderful route to go but i say thank you very much for this great talk thank you so for example in my country kenya um the internet connection may be poor but in terms of uh, mobile phone internet um uh, connection that's really that's really improving with the kind of service providers that we are having of course the challenge is not all the mobile phones are smart but once you have a smart mobile phone um, with a fairly good internet connection and the pricing of data is actually because of competition is coming uh, relatively down then that could be a way of uh, some of these countries starting to roll out uh, telenephrology now we, we have one of the highest um, charges for interconnection inter uh, for uh, cell phone charges for calls and data mm. so you know in south africa they really have to do something to bring those things down see uh, thank uh, one uh, comment th yes thank you very much for right. okay it was a wonderful uh, presentation extremely in covering a lot of ground indeed uh, extremely grateful for this wonderful information and uh, even the use of social media and the examples of use of social media and what the role of isn um the other thing is uh, you know i was there last uh, month uh, to uh, i had been to india and actually in india a lot of the corporate hospitals have started a uh, video conferencing and in tele consultation uh, including nephrology psychiatry and things like that uh, departments like that so what the patient is given an appointment uh, he can actually make an appointment himself or herself online uh, going to the website of the hospital and then what they do is uh, they are made to pay an amount uh, via uh, you know mobile mobile money like it's uh, where they commonly used is uh, google pay or uh, other mobile money that they will like we have in kenya uh, safaricom has got uh, that um, uh, uh, the, the online payment so the, and then uh, go through the entire consultation and then the Uh, the the script is then emailed out to the patient at the end of consultation so i think it's coming on now and i think uh, i'm i'm not i'm sure that it will come on in africa as well in a very short time so it's it's a, it, and, and 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 i don't see any difference between uh, of course i have not seen any studies but uh, doesn't look like any patient satisfaction issues or any difference in outcomes when when they actually manage these people remotely as well thank you so much yeah no uh, thank uh, you uh, I was forgetting to 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 answer the same question actually I was asked and uh, was it about th there was this issue that was raised about to, how do they pay me now of course uh, uh, those patients who end up on dialysis I'm paid I'm paid for that because they you know they they pay for the dialysis but those patients that go on dialysis I'm actually pleased to give consultation free of charge thank you Dr Joseph Tarindo okay oh. thank you very much Yes uh can you can can you Julius can you read the chat box messages and respond or I should read it for you just just go, go through it i think uh, okay they're here all right yeah so um hmm? unfortunately actually very good reason very informative yeah, well. nice so um, what do you, what do you, what do questions what do you, So there is a question here in Kenya how do you educate nurses working in nephrology units do you conduct regular cpd programs um yes um in uh, the, the the nurses working in uh, dialysis units or nephrology units within main hospitals we usually do regular teaching for example in the uh, ward rounds and the dialysis ward rounds that is done and they also have separate nursing cmes the challenge we have in Kenya is this dialysis units in the counties without nephrologists it's really tough Uh, having those patients uh, i mean having those nurses attend regular cpd programs and also having those uh, nurses educated um uh, we're getting you can you please go on mm. is there any questions i've not uh, seen there i think there's only one question on the chat box yeah i think we've, there's only one question in the chat box which we have uh, which actually answered there eh? yeah there are no more questions in the chat box correct yeah, yeah. all right um we can get one more comment dr lloyd before we we, we end no. No I don't have I think uh, Dr Julius has covered so beautifully uh, extensively covered and extremely grateful to have uh, had you here Dr Julius we are very grateful to you indeed and we hope people hear much more uh, or oh, there's one question any monitoring is done like if you do there's a question on the chat box Dr Krabi from uh, KCMC 
There's one question, sorry. Any monitoring is done like you do video conferencing, how sure the remote hospital is doing what you order? Okay, that, that's a good question actually. Um, usually for most of this uh, video conferencing and CKD reviews, you'd had um, the, the nurse, the nurse conducting um, the, the review in the other area, in the other hospital, is charged with the responsibility to carry out the orders that have been agreed during the tele-review of the patients. Like for example, if the labs that have been ordered, the nurse would order those particular labs and schedule the patient on the agreed time. So the nurse in that particular center where we're doing tele-review would do that. In case you're doing the remote monitoring of the patients at home, then the patient, for example, would have to either come to the main hospital for the labs to be done or some specific orders to be done. But in terms of if they're getting reviewed in a remote hospital with a nurse coordinating the review, then the nurse in charge is in charge for, 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 for carrying out the, the orders after that review is done. And then somebody's asking to share the presentation. I'll have it uh, with um, the network and they could share the presentation afterwards. Yeah, I guess a, a PDF is fine. Right. Just a PDF okay. and I'll email it and WhatsApp it to everybody on the audience. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Julius. That was excellent uh, presentation and you covered everything that you know we wanted to know. And I should thank you for your time you took in prepare, preparing this presentation. Should also thank uh, Dr. Lloyd and the team has been working so hard. Thank you, Dr. Kell. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.